as people come in and see this environment that people with ID are working well and the people with ID feel comfortable and the people without ID that are working with them feel comfortable, people are going, oh, I get it. Like this could work, this could happen, this is normal. And we hope that that piece will germinate over time and have other businesses see that if they employ just not the one person with ID, but create a culture of it still hits, I don't miss it, it's go, go, go. Like Go, go, flow, and I'm almost done. And I told you so when I throw these flows, like throw shimbo, and I ain't too close. It's Joe Smoke goes, and I'm on my grind. That is all the time. I do not do brace. That's right, I stay in dry. And look, I'm back with a little bit of that, a little more cash than I came in with. Ready, that cat is out that bad, but I still ask the boy, got skills. I don't need her, I don't need him, I don't need help with me. I got this. I can sing songs, I can spit raps, and I can do both, even do this work. This episode is brought to you by Sweat Tent, the pioneers of the portable wood-burning sauna. Did you know that using the sauna three to four times per week could reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease by up to 50% and make you 60% less likely to experience Alzheimer's disease? That's why I've been a big fan of the sauna for years. But having to go to a crowded gym to do it isn't ideal. And all the at-home options are bulky and expensive. That's why I only use the Sweat Tent for my sauna needs. It's the most storable and affordable wood-burning sauna on the market. It not only takes minutes to set up, but it can reach 200 degrees Fahrenheit in 30 minutes or less. So whether you're enjoying it yourself in your backyard, with friends, or in need of a reliable sauna on the go, Sweat Tent is your best choice for the most portable, storable, and enjoyable outdoor sauna experience. All on the Stacks listeners will receive $100 off when you use code OTS. Visit SweatTent.com today to get $100 off your purchase with code OTS at checkout. Again, that's sweattent.com to get $100 off with code OTS. Sweat Tent, helping you fire up your home wellness routine. This episode is brought to you by Wilkes Consulting, a Ramsey preferred coaching firm. Are you drowning in debt? Is the weight of financial stress holding you back from living the life you were meant to live? Then it's time to break free and regain control of your financial future. Wilkes Consulting specializes in financial and debt consulting. Their team of four highly trained Ramsey Solutions Advisors are ready to help you take charge of your money. Whether you're looking to get out of debt, pay off student loans, or simply need assistance on how to prepare to buy a home, Wilkes Consulting can help you fine-tune your budget and provide the resources and guidance you need to meet your goals. Don't let debt or the fear of finances control your life any longer. Head over to WilkoPA.com and book a hassle-free, no-obligation call. Your first step towards financial freedom. Again, that's WilcoPA.com. W I L C O P A.com. Wilkes Consulting, making financial independence a reality. This episode is brought to you by Burn, the fitness company behind the Today Show approved Burn Board. If I'm being honest, working out can be a real chore, especially as a new dad in desperate need of sleep and cardio. Burn is founded by NEPA native Jimmy T. Martin, and his Burn Board offers a low impact core and cardio experience unlike anything I've done before. They have hundreds of on-demand workouts that are great for beginners, seasoned athletes, and out-of-shape podcast hosts who love supporting small businesses. My wife and I use it pretty frequently throughout the week, and it's honestly a great way to burn a ton of calories without burning a ton of cash. Not to mention, it's a great tool for skiers, runners, wrestlers, and hockey players. Jimmy is offering all On The Stacks listeners 15% off when they use the code STACKS15. Visit theburn.com today to get 15% off your purchase with code STACKS15 at checkout. Again, that's theburn, T-H-E-B-R-R-N.com to get 15% off your purchase with code STACKS15. It's time to get on board today with Burn. What's up, podcast? It's your host, Bill Corcoran Jr. here in the Blue Door Studio, brought to you by Sweat Tent. Frank Bartoli, welcome to the On The Stacks podcast. Thanks for having me, Bill. Well, I should actually say welcome back. Yeah, my second time. Yeah. And I was on uh, before it was even the podcast. That's right. That's Just almost, yeah. on the stacks. Whoa, 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 yeah. Oh my, how, how did Just I, pictures. I almost forgot about that. Huh? Yeah, you, but you're, like, you're, a, you're a repeat offender, <laughs> as, they, as they say. No, man, but we, uh, I feel like there's a lot of catch up, catch, catching up to do here. It's been, uh, you've, got, you've got multiple new, multiple new things going on. And uh, I'm excited to hear about it. I mean, we started a new organization under... NEPA inclusive, and then we changed our name to PA inclusive. So yeah, rebranded, you know, yeah, a little rebranded, re yeah. yeah. So the rebranding was, um, you know, kind of a just kind of a process of you know as we've gone into some additional counties in um, 
Lehigh Valley and Berks County and Schuylkill, you know, to Poconos, and you go there and they say, what does NEPA stand for? And you say in Northeastern Pennsylvania, and we're proud of that, of course, and that's where we're headquartered, but they kind of look at you like, well, you're not from around here. And then we thought, Mm. well, maybe we should, you know, take the NE off and say PA, and then maybe people will feel like we're a little bit more local down there in those regions. So yes, so we rebranded to uh, PA Inclusive, and of course we hope you know, as our services are needed in other places that, um, you know, we, maybe we'll go even further at some point in time, you know, into different regions of the state. Yeah. And by the way, you hooked me up. I got my uh, coffee inclusive cup here. Looks good. It fits, it fits the motif right? here. I mean, you got How the black. About, How bad? You have the, the orange this. bags over there. Oh, my yeah. gosh. Yeah. Wow. It's like you knew. It's like we you did know. it for this. Yeah. Just specifically. Yeah, dude. Yeah, because it's been a while. This is a, this is your first time here in the new in the new place. Yes, it's a lot different. I used to get pizza here back in the day. <laughs> That's what everybody <laughs> says. Yeah, yeah. It used to be uh, used to be a couple different pizza places. I'm still trying to figure out how I can fit like an oven in here and yeah, and sling some pizzas out out back. Everybody's asking for it. I'm sure. What do you think? Should I do it? Pizza's big here. I think you should do it. It is. Yeah, you know. Plus, we get hungry during the show. Right. It'd be nice to you know fresh out of the oven. A multi-use facility. How about that? Or or we could just find a maybe a pizzeria somewhere local that wants to throw us a pizza pizza party every week or two, you know, and they could be a sponsor of the show. I think that's a good idea. Got any? Who, what's your favorite? What's your favorite pizza? Well, yeah, I've been eating Tony's Pizza and Jenkins since I've been a kid. I mean, I'm a big fan of uh, Sabatini's. You know, the, the 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 typical. Do you uh, do you do the pickle pizza at Sabatini's? I do not. I, what? I, I'm, do you like I think pickles? I've heard of the pickle pizza, but I've never had do it. Do you like pickles? Yeah. Yeah? When I was a kid, no, I used you hesitate, to drink. You hesitated a little. Well, when I was a kid, I used to drink the pickle juice. I think we all did. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, yeah. What's not to like about pickles? <laughs> yeah. I love pickles. Yeah. Try the pickle pizza. It's very good. They cut them up in like these little, like almost like little like triangles. Like, like, yeah. Like really small. Really? Yeah. It's not really a pizza. If I saw on a menu, I probably would say, you know what? I think I want a pickle pizza. But now I'm going to try it just yeah, because you should. You know, you're endorsing it. And yes. I've never had one. Yeah. And I'm not being paid to say it either. I think I'm just saying it because I want pickle pizza now because now, oh. you know, now I'm hungry for a pizza. But yeah, because I used to live over, over near Sabatini's and you know, we used to go there a lot. And whenever I go there, pickle pizza it was. And whenever I ordered it, I mean, again, it depends on if you're pickle crazy like me. Like I, I would get double the pickle because I didn't think, oh. that, I, I didn't think that they put on enough. Uh-huh. I mean, it's probably enough for the regular person. You know, I just like extra. I'm I'm an extra kind of guy. You do the pickle shots too. I mean, it's uh, you know, that I don't really do as much. Yeah, yeah. I, I've I've done it though. You know, maybe a yeah. couple two tree here and there. <laughs> a couple two. <laughs> yeah, back in back in my day, right? Uh, but yeah, the pickle pizza. That's nice. where it's at. Um, so yeah, we'll uh, one of these days we'll we'll be sharing a pickle pizza over at Sabs. Sounds like a plan. I love it. I totally derailed you there. Totally. It totally derailed your story. Now I'm going to be hungry thinking the rest of the show, waiting for this to over so I can go get a pizza. I know. Yeah. All right, show's over. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Continue it after the pizza. Um, but yeah, no, uh, like I said, I think um, I, I'd love to, I'd love to like dive deeper a little bit into, you know, the community, you know, the space that you're in and, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, because I think there's not enough people or organizations really you know, obviously there's only so much you guys can do. There's only so much you can probably grow, right? And right. I'm sure a lot, you know, obviously you got grants right. and, you know, fundraising and all that. But um, I'd love to just kind of dive into the the community and see, you know, you know, where you guys are at, uh, the impact, you know, mm-hmm. that you've had and, and just uh, really kind of talk about all of it because there's, there's a lot to it. Coffee Inclusive? Yeah. So Coffee Inclusive was... Um you know, NEPA and, and now PA Inclusive is, you know, what's considered a provider agency. So, you know, we, we contract with the state offices of um, developmental programs and Office of Vocational Rehabilitation provide services. And we just felt like there were some more needs that were in a different um, kind of arena. And that would be services that um, we could we can build in a, in a way that we can create an entity that could be more of kind of a community center focused on things that people with intellectual disabilities and autism that need but aren't funded. Um, and when you kind of look at some of those things, you know, what, what do people need? And so, you know, people with ID, they need recreational activities, they need 
and they want employment opportunities and uh, they want opportunities to learn how to work in, in the right environment and then to but actually to be um, be trained in a way that um, can can lead to meaningful employment. And so, you know, we, we kind of thought, well, why don't we create something that provides some uh, employment opportunities for people with autism and intellectual and developmental disabilities. And a, a small coffee shop environment was available in our building next to our corporate offices in Pittston. And we thought, well, let's give it a shot. And we did. And it was really high, highly successful in the in many terms outside of finances. And so many um Every place I go, people want to talk to me about Coffee Inclusive and want to say what a great thing we're doing and um, that know about it and maybe have had a coffee and, and things of that nature. So, you know, it made us realize, well, I mean, if, if we've got Coffee Inclusive and it's so popular and people like the idea, um, being a very small coffee shop is kind of hard to, you know, provide a platform of finances to support that long term and there's more needs. And so there was additional space available in the same location, which nobody really realizes is there because it's behind a closed door. But it's it's pretty big. It's I mean, it's about 5,000 square feet. So we've taken that over. This additional? Additional. Additional 5,000. Yeah, That's additional. Like, yeah. Yeah. Wow. I mean, about. I don't, yeah, yeah, I'd yeah. have to see exactly yeah. how many, but about that. And yeah. so we made some additional corporate offices out of it and a big training conference room. And we're going to put a bakery in. And we kind of termed it bake inclusive to kind of coin off of the terms coffee inclusive, but it's really not a, another business. It's just kind of an extension of coffee inclusive, but it's now going to be able to bake products that we can sell at the coffee shop, provide additional employment opportunities for people with disabilities, and um, also um, create a training uh, program whereby high school students could come um, and be trained in or in the food service industry at pace, meaning you know it's open to the public. You want to come in and you want to get a coffee and a breakfast sandwich. You come in like you would go to any other restaurant or any other coffee shop, and they have to learn. They're going to have to learn how to work at the same pace that they would at any other open to the public business. But um, you know, we thought what would be a really good idea would be if we can train individuals at pace with the regular type of equipment that they would use. Now, the equipment that we have that's coming into this uh, bakery is state-of-the-art um, you know, convection or oven type equipment, um, mixers and things of that nature. The same types of equipment that they would use if they were hired at another like coffee shop. if me shop. or you open a coffee shop right. and said, we, hey. Yeah, we couldn't use equipment that was old anymore. You have to use something current. So that's going to be all current equipment. They're going to learn on that learn to work with the public as the public would. And like, you know, we get people come in a coffee shop and say, I want a coffee, but I want a, I want oat milk. And then if somebody puts a regular milk in, then they send it back and say, you know, I need oat milk because I'm lactose intolerant or something like that. So, you know, they have to really learn how to work in a real environment. Yeah, so it's not just like, oh, hey, here's this thing in this back office. Go, uh, no. you know. It's like a storefront. Like this is like a this is the real deal. This is the real deal. You walk in, you're gonna walk in. You want to order uh, two dozen cookies for your kid's birthday party coming up, uh, something of that nature. You place the order in advance. You show up. They're gonna be in the boxes. They're gonna have to give them to you. They're gonna have to charge you for it. You know that whole environment is the same thing. Make a cup of coffee. Make a smoothie. Make a breakfast sandwich. You know, bake cookies. Bake cupcakes. They're gonna you know be doing it all. But what's going to be kind of unique about this environment is when students that come to us from schools, high schools, um, do their training program, they're not going to be there 365 days of the year. I mean, we'll be closed probably four or five, six days, you know, major holidays. But those other days, somebody's going to have to actually work there. So when the students aren't working, or when the students aren't there, and even when they are, we're still going to need to employ some of the individuals with disabilities to fill in the gaps around when the students aren't there, um, either if they're just not there during the day sometime or if it's a day off of school, a holiday in between, you know, Christmas and New Year's, that type of stuff. So this is going to be really a, um, a um, school to work program, meaning we're going to we're going to invite schools to bring students in. We're, we're going to work on training them at pace and then self-employing them in our own bakery and coffee shop when um, when it's ready when they age out of high school or graduate high school, and then also help them find other jobs in the community at other food service industry, culinary arts type 
programs, uh, restaurants, and so on. So we've got a lot of different kind of things happening on the employment side and the training side, but it's not a training program for adults with disabilities. They have to be in school to be in the training program because we want to make sure that, you know, people with uh, disabilities that are adults are actually gainfully employed. And that's another kind of different component to that. <clears throat> how, do you, how, do you, how does one go about like the funding for all this, this stuff? Um, well, um, there are private donations. We're doing a campaign right now, $150,000 in 150 days. So we're asking people um, and businesses and foundations and corporations to provide funding via donations and grants and sponsorships. Um, and then from an ongoing uh, perspective, um, the sales of the products at the coffee shop and bakery will help support the workers there, number one. So, you know, any, um, you know, business, bakery, coffee shop that needs that, can, that has to stay open has to sell enough food and, and beverages to keep the doors open. And that is what this environment is going to be like. We can also raise money and get grants. Um, and also, if schools um, and families wanted to come and, as part of the training program, schools could um, could come to the program, send students under the IEP 504 plans that schools are required to train students with disabilities and get funding from the state to do that. They can pass some of that on to us to do some of that training, and they do that from time to time. They do that a lot. They 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 um they either do it themselves or they outsource it to a third party to help do training. So we'll be one of the options that schools can choose. So it's really a combination of, you know, grants, program fees. We're going to have classes, cooking classes for kids, mommy and me cookie classes. You know, maybe if we get organized enough and, and get sophisticated enough canning classes, you know, things like that, just kind of fun. You know, there's a huge, you know, movement in the world to healthier foods. There's a, there's a huge movement to teach people how to garden how to can their goods, you know, how to have healthier choices. I mean, one of the issues with people with disabilities also is the health disparities amongst people with intellectual disabilities are very unhealthy compared to the general population. So we want to, you know, help them learn how to cook better and how to make recipes better and things of that nature. Why do you, why do you think that, why do you think um, there's such a difference there? Like, is it, is it, do you think there's lack of programs like y yours, for example, that are, that are actually teaching this stuff, um, you know, I think it's. Um, I think like where's the root? I'm, just, I'm trying to figure out like where where is it? Where does it come from? Like where's the root cause? My, of my my general thought process would be it's probably a socioeconomic issue. I mean, people with intellectual disabilities that live on their own in the community maybe, you know, make eight hundred or eight hundred fifty dollars a month on social security, so they have a limited amount of money that they can spend on on rent and food, and you know what's happening with rent these days. So and food costs. So yeah, through the roof. You know they're. You know, and it's probably also an education, you know, you know, it's probably just their, their environment, you know, their, their low income uh, families may be eating poor choices and they're not being trained properly. So it's like a mix of a mix of a lot of things. Yeah. They probably don't know how to cook food on their own. So they're probably eating a lot out and they're probably eating a lot of fast foods, you know, uh, processed foods, a lot of uh, fried quick. foods, yeah. yeah, you know, easy, quick, you know, um, you know. It's like everybody else in, in America, right? So, we, you know, we want to provide opportunities for that. But, you know, this is not just for people with disabilities. This is a community center open to the public. So we also like to see, like, when you walk into Coffee Inclusive, you see people without disabilities working alongside with people with disabilities. And you see the general public there buying uh, products uh, and sitting there and having conversations. So you see kind of uh, an integrated and inclusive community center concept and I think the more that we um, promote that idea where you know if people come and sit in the coffee shop you know on their laptop having a coffee and a breakfast sandwich and they're served by a person with a disability maybe somebody behind the counter also doesn't have a disability and maybe somebody uh, with a disability also is in there having something to eat and so there's this kind of social environment where there's social connectiveness for people with disabilities and the general public and the general public, the awareness um, and the advocacy and the and the um, kind of the environment of learning more and being more friendly with people with intellectual disabilities, we hope might break down some barriers of people feeling like, oh, well, that person lives next to me, but I don't know that person and they have intellectual disability and I'm not sure how to talk to them. Well, if they're in our facility and doing the whole thing, maybe they'll feel more comfortable.
Yeah. Yeah. Besides that, like how, how, how does somebody bridge that gap? Right. Like if somebody's never been around anyone with an intellectual dis disability, like how does, how does someone go about, you know, either working with or trying to you know understand, you know, somebody, you know, you know, in that space. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I mean, it's just, uh, it, you know, it, it's like everything else, you know, like, um, if I get in an apartment someplace and I don't know my neighbors, there's an immediate, I'm not sure if I should talk to that person and if they're gonna be you know, nice to me. And then you have maybe language barriers and behavioral barriers with somebody else. And they're not necessarily somebody that you would say, you know what, I'm gonna like go golf tomorrow, so I'm gonna go ask my neighbor, I don't have anybody to golf with. They might think, well, they can't do that, so they don't do that. So they won't, they won't invite, right. yeah, they won't like include them yeah, and I think that's probably just a natural human condition. Like, I don't know them. I'm not familiar with them. I don't understand their, their issues and their conditions, so I'm just going to kind of live my life and let them live their life. Mm -hmm. Well, we hope that this will change some of the dynamic by people getting to know people. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, off, I mean, really, oftentimes, just like you said, like, you know, things like with neighbors and stuff, until, like, you, you know, really just take the time to just, like, have a conversation, it's, like, it's actually a lot easier than I think most people think. Right. You know, like it's 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 not that difficult. And I think, you know, just simply having a human connection and just saying, hey, how you doing today? Could really yeah. go a long way. <clears throat> yeah. And I think it goes the other way, too. And, you know, the longer I've been doing this now, as you know, I have a daughter with Down syndrome and I was in the YMCA movement for a long time. And then I went into the intellectual disability advocacy world. And then I started this provider organization and program organization and even me. After all these years, Ellie's 25, <clears throat> you know, I'm still learning how these social connections, they, you know, they call it social co um, capital, right? And things like that. But I mean, the reality too is the person with a disability feels a little bit uneasy about the person next to them too, right? I mean, it's, we forget that people with disabilities, intellectual disabilities also have their own ideas and their own thoughts and their own feelings. We Emotions. always are thinking about ourselves, thinking I'm not sure about them, but you know, not, they're not sure about us either right yeah yeah, yeah. well you know i i, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't be too sure about me or you either but <laughs> right but no it makes sense and when you really <clears throat> when you really said that like i think it puts a lot in perspective you know because like like you said i think a lot of times most people are only thinking it from like their point of view and not mm -hmm. thinking like hey well, well how do they feel right now right right so you know we what i'm seeing too is you know people that work for coffee inclusive that have disabilities that have worked in other businesses you know, there's there's something about coffee inclusive work environment that people with disabilities feel more comfortable in, and and I think that's a derivative of if you're working in um, a fast paced restaurant and you're the only person with an intellectual disability there, um, and you're maybe not really able to kind of keep at pace or something like that, and um, maybe there's not a lot of patience, and a lot of the workers maybe aren't trained and conditioned to slow it down a little bit and say, okay, let's get this right, let's create this great environment. But they, you know, they, when they work for us, they seem to like do really well and the public seems to accept them working at pace. But I would have to say they work pretty close, I mean, they work really well, probably, right? So, yeah, yeah. Now, nowadays the workforce, man, I mean, they're, they're, they're probably better workers than, than most people, believe it or not. Uh, well, you know, we were very surprised when we started Coffee Inclusive because we had these all these plans about job coaches that aren't funded by the state, and we're like, we're gonna have to get volunteers because no, the state's not paying us for this, you know, they pay for us a job coach in the other company, but not in this company. And so we had this all lined up, and uh, people that we hired with intellectual disabilities started doing the jobs kind of on their own easily. And we were like, wow, we don't really need these job coaches. Like, this is strange. Wow. <laughs> we're supposed yeah. to be the ones that get it, right? We're supposed <laughs> to be the ones that know this, right? Yeah. But yeah. we are like, wow, they're doing it pretty well. But the point I'm trying to make in, in, in overall in the, in the kind of that, that conversation is, um, you know, as, as people come in and see this environment, that people with ID are working well and the people with ID feel comfortable and the people without ID that are working with them feel comfortable, people are going, oh, I get it. Like, this could this could work. This could happen. This is normal. You know, and we hope that that piece will germinate over time and, and, and have other businesses see that if they employ just not the one person with ID, but create a culture of, of, of employing multiple people, um, 
and creating an environment and a culture where the rest of the staff and their patrons are accepting of this type of an environment, that everybody's gonna realize it's a good thing. And I think they're seeing that in Coffee Inclusive, but they're still thinking like, that works over there, and that's great. But we wanna try to make it so that they all do it, and then everybody will be fine, and then maybe Coffee Inclusive doesn't have to exist anymore, because then everybody will be doing it. Yeah, I mean, it makes total sense because, like you said, like, you know, we'll just take like a Burger King or McDonald's or something, for example. And if there's only one individual there with an intellectual dis- disability, like you said, like it, it, it probably puts it puts that individual kind of like on edge and the rest of the staff and maybe the patrons. Right. And they're like, oh, I don't know. I don't know what to do here. And it's like it could be yeah. awkward because like no one's communicating the right way, I feel like. Yeah. And the, the culture isn't there. Mm-hmm. But you you like you you know how to like you've created the culture within within your place and i think that's the secret sauce i guess yeah i mean we really could demonstrate like if somebody went in there and did an expose do they call it that these days if somebody went in there sounds really good did some real deep dive into video footage and explanations i think what you'd find is this thing operates it's a non-profit organization it's a 501c3 charitable non-profit but it operates a storefront business like any other business would be and I think people would say you know this really works and there's really like typically speaking there's a barista without a disability and a barista with a disability paired up together and if you walk in somebody has to take the order somebody has to make it and somebody has to serve it and those two people are doing all that just like they would somewhere else and we get very few complaints that the products aren't done properly um, or that it's too slow. So if it can work there, why can't it work somewhere else? Right. Have you had any other businesses or anyone like, you know, kind of reach out to you or anything just to maybe share more of this knowledge with anyone? Or like, or do you reach out to other businesses? Like, Well, you know, we, we just haven't gotten to a point where we've gotten there. And that's just a function of, you know, we've been trying to build this new part of the program, the bakery now. And um, you know, so we really haven't gotten there, but we want to. Our, our overall plan was always um, let's also get people safe, serve certified so we can help them get other jobs. And, we ju- you know, we just haven't gotten there. And it's been a little bit disappointing for me. But I think once we open the bakery and once we have a bigger infrastructure, you know, more, more revenues coming in, you know, more capacity for us to do some of that, I think we'll do that. I will say, and I will give a shout out to Abide coffee shop because Dan is uh, he's asked me a couple times and we just haven't gotten to a point where we where where we have somebody that wants to go there but he's asked me um, once or twice we've had conversations he's been awesome and there's a shout out to another coffee shop from a coffee shop that you know um, I think we can see something like that happening yeah uh, we haven't made it happen yet but he's inquired well, that's good yeah so what what's what's the challenge with the safe serve thing like what's 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 that Um, You know, we we just don't have the management staff right now um, and the time dedicated to doing the, um, you know, to doing it. Um, Like I said, running a very small operation um, isn't as um, economically feasible as I originally thought it would be. So, you know, when you're not baking your own goods and you're, you're, re, you're revending somebody else's baked goods and when you're not roasting your own coffee and you're revending somebody else's roasted coffee, you're kind of like, okay, this is a very small operation. We have two people on almost all the time when other coffee shops at the slow periods might have one because we have somebody with a disability working with somebody without a disability. So I think when we get a little bit bigger and we maybe can get some grants for training dollars or we could just get some more... Um, staffing involved and, and some more time, you know, that we could try to start to get some people safe cert certified. I think we'll we'll move in that direction. What? Uh, how many? How many people does it employ right now? And then with the with the addition of the you know the extension with the bakery, mm-hmm. what's the what's the goal? Like, what's what's that look like? On the stacks, we'll be back in a flash after a word from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Elevation Wellness, NEPA's premier wellness center located on Monday Street in Wilkesbury. From pro athletes to busy parents, Elevation Wellness is leading the conversation when it comes to bettering your health through integrative medicine. 
Founded by NEPA native Louis Helmecki, Elevation Wellness offers physician-formulated and guided treatments that are administered by registered nurses. To learn more about how you can experience the benefits of IV vitamin therapy, multivitamin booster shots, non-invasive aesthetics, or peptide, NAD, red light, and compression therapy, visit elevation-wellness.com or follow them on Instagram at elevationwellnessnepa. All on the Stacks listeners will receive 10% off their first purchase with code STACKS at checkout. Call 570-762-9400 or visit elevation-wellness.com to book your appointment today. Elevation Wellness, taking your health to new heights. A lot of times when people are in car accidents, kind of forget what we should do. First and foremost, call 911. Then get out of your car before moving it and take pictures. It's so important to capture what the cars look like immediately following the accident. Finally, call your insurance carrier and make a claim. To learn more, visit Anzalone Law Offices online at anzalonelaw.com. This episode is brought to you by Loop Internet. Are you tired of buffering, lagging, and slow internet speeds? Look no further. Introducing Loop Internet, Northeastern Pennsylvania's fastest and most reliable internet service provider. With Loop Internet, you can stream, game, and work from home seamlessly. Say goodbye to interruptions and hello to lightning fast connections. Loop Internet offers both residential and business fiber. Fast track the future with their 10 gigabyte fiber and join the Loop Internet family today. Visit Loop Internet online at loopinternet.com or call 1-888-808-5667. Again, that's 1-888-808-5667 or visit them online at loopinternet.com. Loop Internet, where speed meets reliability. And now we're back on the stacks. Well, we have about 18 now. Um, I think we're going to end up with about 25 or 30. But 18, you have 18 now. Yeah, we have wow. about 18. And a lot of I the people that, that many. yeah, a lot of the people that we have with ID work very limited shifts. You know, okay. so you work one shift a week for a few hours, or some people work two shifts. You know, many people with with intellectual disabilities and so on only want to work so off so long because they get social security and they don't want that impacted. And we also have the issue where we have a lot of people who want to work for us. So in order to, to allow a number of people to work for us, we have to do limited you shifts. You got to accommodate them all, right? Yeah, we have to. Yeah. Right. And so we also have like catering that will go out and do catering. If somebody wanted to do a catering event for us, we can go there. Or we can go to a festival. And so sometimes we have you know somebody working at the coffee shop and somebody out at an external, in, uh, uh, you know, an external place working too. So. You know, it's a it's a combination of things, but I think we'll we'll settle in. You know, if we get students in for training and employees, you know, we'll probably end up with about twenty five employed, and then some volunteers and so on. Once and so once forth. the the bakery's up and yeah, up and around. Yeah, what, what's yeah. what's uh what's the timeline? What's the, what, where are you at right now? Um, as soon as we can get the renovations completed, which which right now just basically includes some electrical uh, work, um, uh, the drywalling and painting and the floors. You know, we should be up and running probably um, end of, you know, April to the public. We'll probably do some training and some soft openings. And so I'm hoping sometime in April. Nice. So you got like, you got equipment, like what's, uh, what are the capabilities of the, of the bake shop? Well, it's interesting because, you know, I'm new to this. I've never really done myself a retail environment. So we had a consultant who does this type of stuff, Gary Rice. He has his own company rice is whatever uh, i forget the name of this company but he he sells this type of equipment locally and he recommended the layout and he recommended all the equipment and so he said okay we'll go with what you're saying you know and one of the concerns was um having ovens that didn't need to be vented because if you have venting needs then you have all kinds of different infrastructure that's a whole nother yeah, it's a, thing yeah, right, right. So they were like, no, go with these convection ovens and they don't need vents and you could just bake things, you know, in the ovens and, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to renovate and get things something going. It's okay, we'll do that. Well, we didn't know. We were talking to a restaurant that's going to be opening up in our building and they came over to tour it and they're like, oh, these ovens? Like you could do brisk, briskets, in, uh, briskets in there. And I'm like, really? And they're like, yeah, you could do a lot of things in there. So I was talking Maybe to Maybe pickle pizza? Maybe, but I was talking to somebody about like breakfast sandwiches, right? I'm Ooh, like everybody yeah. wants a bagel yes. and 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 a and a and a and a you know 
piece of meat and sausage, uh, egg, and cheese. You know, yeah, egg. And I'm like, well, maybe we can order the pre-made egg discs. And um, and the person was like, well, no, I, I you know I, I can make those in those ovens. So like you could just take these little pans with circles and almost like a muffin pan. You can actually make them like and like, and crack the egg in there and put it in the oven. You can make it. So we're wow. going to be able to make you know pretty, fresh. Yeah, fresh. Yeah, oh, I love it. So you're going to be able to make you know quiches and bacon and egg sandwiches, you know, bagels. You're going to be able to make you know you know small sandwiches, paninis. You know you could even make some more sophisticated stuff in those ovens that I I doubt will do. Because, you know, we're going to be more of a bakery, you know, so it's going to be like, you know, baked goods and breakfast sandwiches and lunch sandwiches. And, you know, that that's probably the format, you know, because there's probably that's probably the lane that we should stay in a little bit more easy, simple, not too complicated. And it's more about the training. It's more about the employment. It's all more about the community center, you know, offer some classes, like I said, I mean, really kind of. You know, bring in a guitarist once a month or something on a Friday night and, you know, have a bit of a social. I mean, those types of things, you know, fall festival, you know, if your kids are off of school on a on a holiday like Veterans Day or something, maybe there's a class for the day there. You, you, you might not remember when I was a kid and you know, when I was a Y professional in my early days, we had what was called Saturday morning at the Y, which was, you know, for those kids that didn't um, join sports classes they could go to the y for like four hours and you know swim and do some activities in the gym and you know kind of hang out and you know something like that you know summer camp kind of things yeah, you know yeah. we've got that whole riverfront into downtown Pittston yeah, there which is awesome and there's a trail that runs behind the oregon section in Pittston, so we feel like we've got some capacity to kind of blend in some riverfront type activities i'm talking to a guy i should say he's talking to me his name is uh Jerry Reisinger, he's a he's a doctor, a doc, um, you know, a PhD. He's the engineer, the, in, the environmental engineer that, that that did all the work on the the riverfront for the city of Pittston and Mike Lombardo. And um, he he seems pretty brilliant and knowledgeable. He's got a small group of people that are really into Native American history for that river, and they want to do something collaborative with us on helping plant Native American plants and doing some seminars and maybe some signage like, you know, to, to commemorate, you know, historical stuff of Native Americans. So that's kind of the community center kind of capacity of it. It's like it's a nonprofit. It's got a bit of an indoor facility. It does have some outdoor capacity. We don't know, but I'm sure we can use. And, um, you know, if we could do something that jointly kind of connects you know, history of the Native Americans into how this thing all happened. I mean, hey, I'm all for it. I mean, it, that's what a nonprofit is there for. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like you guys are really. Uh, yeah, I mean, you got the 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 water, everything right there. You tie it all together, do some some nature stuff. Yeah, and you're gonna have seating overlooking the river. Can't They've got it. these like, you know, the 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 building, the room that we're gonna be in has like five or six, t- ten, you know, t- fifteen foot by ten feet plate glass windows overlooking the Susquehanna River. So, you know, to sit there and kind of see that is going to be, you know, a unique environment too. Yeah. I want to come sit there. Yeah. It's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. You got, you got the, got the killer views, you know? Um, but the real question is, uh, when is pizza inclusive opening? This is, uh-huh. this is, I'm getting ahead of myself here though. This whole pizza talk. Oh yeah. yeah. Well, it, it's not, it's not pizza. We're not going to, you know, I don't foresee us doing pizza. Although what do I know? Maybe there's a way to Maybe. make small personal pizzas one day yeah, a month or something there. So yeah, yeah. it could happen. Well, you can at least, yeah. And yeah. if we do it, we're going to have pickle pizza. And you better, I remember your first phone call. We're, we're going to have Bill Corcoran Jr.'s pickled pizza. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You got to name it after me on the menu. I'll come. I'll, I'll help make it. You know, um, please include me in the a you know, guest the pizza maker. Oh, yeah. We have guest baristas this month for um, mm. for coffee inclusive. So, um, you know, that's a way to bring, you know, either political type figures or we had champ there this weekend to be a guest barista to bring awareness to, you know, coffee oh, inclusive. I- but then we can have Bill making pizza. Listen, I and I also yes, and I'm I'm down for that. But I also I also have another uh, great person for you. His name's right here behind me. I mean, I should point this way. Uh, Brian DeMattei. So uh-huh. uh, yeah. this podcast, by the time this show airs, his show will already be a few episodes deep. But um, it's launching in real time right now, like in a couple of days. Uh, but uh, 
we'll have to we'll send Brian up. Brian does like are you familiar like are you familiar with like uh, no, there's uh, NPA Pizza Review Jim Mirabelli mm-hmm. yeah and then uh, Brian he's uh, he does D Mate's Food Fight on on Facebook if you're if you're not familiar uh, check it out but he just again uh, similar to Jim but Jim does mostly just pizza and sauce and stuff right but so Brian does like a little bit of everything um, so I'm uh, nice. I'm, I'm not, Brian's next homework assignment is to come to Coffee Inclusive. And, uh, you know, he's gonna, he'll come, he'll do a review. That'd be awesome. And you see, that's also one thing I want to do. And I, I don't know, maybe I'm different. I mean, um, you know, I'd like, I'd like there to be connections to other things with Coffee Inclusive, because I think that's what community is about, right? So, you know, last fall we did pop-up shops for the holidays. People can come in and put up a shop and sell their, their goods for, um, for the holidays. You can go in there and buy a gift for somebody. We had a sensitive Santa. Well, that was an external party that came in and did that. Um, I've been talking to um, Jackie from the Jumpstart Cart, who runs a food car, a food uh, yeah, truck for yeah, people yeah. with disabilities. Yep. You know, and if we could bring in, I'm I'm trying to talk to people like LCC about maybe some of their students coming up in the culinary arts program and learning how to work with people with disabilities. I mean, to me, it's kind of like. You know, if we had people like that came in once a month or even just once a year, sometimes the NEPA networkers come in and have their networking event and our thing. You know, the more you could bring people in, the more they see people with disabilities and the inherent abilities and the comfort that they have with them. I mean, the more you can do those kinds of things, the better off everybody in the community is. And you can only do that really more effectively if you work hard at bringing in external partners, because if not... You know the region we live in, right? Like, oh man, I mean, coming down here was like, wow, I had to cross the river. Oh you know? yeah, oh boy, I had to go to Scranton Ooh. the other yeah, day. Yeah, you, 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 you had to get your passport out. Like, <laughs> I mean, I mean like, you know, woo. people yeah. do not like to travel here, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. I, I interviewed a girl when I was at the Pits and Wine many, many years ago for a program director position, and she said, you know, she was from Dallas, and she said, I have never been to downtown Pittston my whole life, and I'm like, you're like in your twenties. She's <laughs> yeah. like in Dallas. I'm sure it's different now because it's like 25 years ago. But she yeah. was like, yeah, we get on the highway, you know, we got 309, we get to 81, we go where we want to go. So we don't like to travel here as much as we do in other regions. So I think the way to do it is to have events and activities and bring people in. And then people say, oh, well, yeah, geez, you know, Brian's going to, you know, Diamante's going to be there. I'm going to go there that day. Yeah, and then right. they'll see it. Yeah. But normally, you know, coffee is a commodity. I'm not necessarily going out of my way. Mm, for, for for the right co- and experience, right yeah, coffee right? and experience. It's the, experience. it's the experience. That's why we think the windows overlooking the river. You know, um, roasting our own coffee, having more foods, having events. Yeah, I think creates experiences, and I think we've got to do that so more people can come and see what we do. And then from there, we can then expand into multiple, um, you know, locations. Maybe uh, maybe me and Brian will come together if you if you're if you're cool with uh, two two guest barista baristas like I don't know I don't know how to say it. that's a fancy word by the way barista yeah. barista well, barista you know, I don't know we got to be fancy we got to be yeah of the art yeah but uh you know I think uh, I think we got to come up and uh, open get, invitation uh, oh we're we're coming all right we're coming yeah, whether you said yes or not I, we were already <laughs> I was over here texting Brian when you weren't looking nice. Uh, but yeah, no, I think that'll, I think that'll be cool. And I think a lot of it, I think what it is, is like you said, like that exposure, once you get people there and once you get people having conversations and interacting, it's really, really, I think all that it comes down to is like the fear of the unknown. Right. So yeah. if, if, yeah. you know, for example, if no one's, if somebody has never been in the presence, you know, personally, or professionally with somebody with an intellectual disability, it's just the fear of the unknown. Right, like just as anything else. Yeah, you know, you're 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 going to work somewhere, and it's like you don't know your coworkers, whatever. Right, it's kind of the same thing. I mean, obviously a little different, right? But it's it's just with anything. It's just it's it's what people don't understand. And if you don't understand people with intellectual disabilities, you're obviously not really you're probably not going to put yourself in that position. So you know, you know, right. I, I would you know I encourage right. people. And I know you obviously do too. To uh, you know, put yourself put yourself in that position. Like like I said, like you know, Brian and I first I volunteered Brian. And I'm like, you know what? I gotta I gotta put myself in there too. Like, you know, I can't just send him up there. I gotta come too. And as I'm as I'm preaching to people to to you know get yourself involved, you know, I got I gotta throw myself my my own hat in the ring. You know, so I think that's I think that's really a lot of it is it just comes down to that. It's just you know doing it like just try like being being in the presence, just engaging and doing it like meaningfully, not just. You know what I mean? Like actually be present, right. actually try, like try to understand, try to learn, right. try to work and be, you know, you know, be patient with everybody. And uh, I think it'd make a big difference. So I challenge all the people 
listening and watching to uh come on down yeah this is like the price is right come on down <laughs> there we go yeah yeah so no i think that i think a lot of it is i think it's just the fear of fear of unknown people just don't know a lot of people are awkward man like yeah. people, people just don't know yeah. like what to do or how to act or like oh what do i say yeah yeah right no there's no doubt about it yeah yeah so i mean you know a lot of people with autism and, and id uh, have so, their own social you know they, they have some of them are nonverbal. Mm -hmm. some you know have a difficulty communicating and you know social communication and and so on and it is i mean it's 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 a natural part of that condition and we just we just got to get it get people more comfortable yeah 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 what do you think is um you know whether it's a challenge you know that you see personally like what, what do you think is like one of the biggest challenges maybe in this area or just in general with with the intellectual disability community is there something like that you're facing right now or is there just i'll say maybe something ongoing that you guys have just always been like yeah we really struggle with x and uh you know i'd love to just have that conversation and talk about it and and let people make people understand and more aware of like what what you're really dealing with behind the scenes because you know you're a busy guy you're out there, you know, doing the thing every day. And it's, it's probably not every day that you get to, I'll say, share maybe mm -hmm. some of this behind the scenes mm -hmm. stuff that most people don't know is actually going on. Well, I, I think social isolationism is, is big, right? So um, typically speaking in school, people with um, intellectual disability students are in segregated classrooms. Um, you know, when they graduate high school, they go to day programs and live in group homes in general in the historical context. So our organization has worked very hard at doing the opposite, which is uh, help people live in their own apartments. If they live with their families, help get them out to the community, help find them jobs. But there's no doubt um, still, um, you know, that that social disconnect and, the, and, and isolation of people with disabilities living in the community for everything we've just talked about. That's one for sure. And we can do better as a society. And this whole movement to like DEI A and, you know, our our entire discussion over diversity over the course of of history really has been about more about race and gender than it's been about disability. And so, you know, I, I want us to have conversations about including people with intellectual disabilities, autism, developmental disabilities in the conversations about diversity, equity, um, you know, um, and inclusion, you know, because they're a part of our society. The other thing that, that I'm working on and I'm trying to work on, and I hope I'm going to be successful at it, is, um, you know, the systems talk more to each other than they ever did, but they still don't talk to each other the way that they should and the way that they could. And I think that's just a part of time and money and focus. Um, I don't think it's anybody's fault. I think they all want to do a good job of it, um, but they don't um, in many ways. So, you know, I see a lot of disconnectedness between, you know, somebody with a disability that gets a service from the Office of Vocational Rehabilitation and has services from their high school and then maybe gets a service from Office of Development or programs for their waiver. Those systems are still are not communicating enough with each other to make a significant impact. Um, and I can give you some examples if we have time. You know, one is, you know, the school is, is, um, is by law required to provide job training for students with disabilities. OVR, Office of Vocational Rehabilitation, is required by law to provide um, job training to students with disabilities. And then um, the, the Intellectual Disability Waiver is, is a funded source to provide um, you know, jobs for people with disabilities. But the reality of what happens is when I first started working in, in the field, OVR didn't even have high school students under their umbrella. Not long before I started, they didn't even have adults with the ID waiver under their umbrella. So we're only talking about like 15 years of them working together. So I think it's a natural part of development that they're not as great at it as they will be maybe in another 10 years, right? But like 10 years, 15 years ago, OVR was never even in high schools. Then there was a, a law that was passed that opened up OVR to go into high schools. And so now OVR goes into high schools and they do a pretty good job and they do coordinate with high schools. But um, when a student um, goes to high school and gets job trained, and then um, gets an OVR contract, um, I might get a call, you know, our agency or another agency, and, you know, we might 
have an opportunity to provide a job placement for that student for 90 hours to do basically an internship called a paid work experience. But we don't really get any history from that student, right? And so what happened the last couple of years in high school that we don't know about? We're not given a case file. There's not like a big profile for this person. Um, and the school isn't at this point conditioned to have any expectation to get them an actual job. So it's kind of like job train, job train, job train, then go to OVR, job train, and then we get a call and providers like us get a call from the system when they're an adult and OVR says we want you to help them find them a job. But we don't really get a lot of rich history of what they've done for the last five or six years. So I'm trying to change some of that internally for ourselves and we have started a program called Transition Academy Social Club and that's a social club in the evenings for students with disabilities so we they can come and have some fun, learn some self-advocacy, learn some independent living skills, learn some workplace readiness skills. We do pre-tests and post-tests, but we do a lot of game environments and fun environments. Um, to, so to create a bit of a social uh, program for individuals, uh, students with disabilities, but also then begin to case manage them before the system gives them to us so we know them a little bit better. And I'm a big believer in the end result needs to be better outcomes for employment, not just I got somebody a job because I could get somebody a job that they don't like and they're going to quit. And then it makes us all look bad and we do a disservice to the person with the disability. So for as much as, for as hard as we're working on it um, now, and we are, we believe me, we are working on it. These places that I'm talking about, schools, OVR, ODP, they're working really hard on it. But, you know, can we find some strategies that could enhance them and bring them together and make the, the first outcome of employment better because if we can make the first outcome of employment better and that person stays in that job longer, then we've, then we've done a better job. So we're trying to create some of our own kind of programming to help, um, to help do that. And I think Transition Academy Social Club, I think Coffee Inclusive, um, the, uh, the Inclusive um, transitional employment program that we're going to be offering out of Coffee Inclusive, I think they are actually strategies that could improve um, the first outcome of employment, and that could be transcending to the actual population of people with intellectual disabilities. Now, there may be people that hear me talk about this and kind of get a little bit like, hey, you know, that's a little bit of our territory, or we do a good job of that, and I'm, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying, like anything else, um, you know, my friend bought a, you know, a Harley Davidson road glide and, you know, he put a lot of different upgrades into it because it wasn't what he wanted and it wasn't as good as he wanted it and it wasn't the right whatever that he wanted it. I think you can make the same kind of comparisons to anything that schools or OVR or ODP is doing is for some people we can always do something better. And if we all did it together and did a little bit of a better job, maybe we can have a better outcome. So they do great work. Um, and, you know, I'm just trying to find some avenues that that I see are some still some weaknesses and trying to make some improvements on that. And we do that on our dime. I mean, we do the social club, you know, in all of our counties uh, for free. Um, now, we were lucky to get a grant this year from the county for ARPA for our program here. But once that's over, we'll be offering that again free. So, you know, I think some of the things that people don't see about any PA, uh, PA inclusive and um, coffee inclusive is, you know, the work that we're actually doing is, um, you don't, you know, people don't really see it. They don't understand it. We're really trying to change the dynamic of helping people with disabilities find good jobs and be successful on the job. Um, and most providers are doing that, but we are doing some things that are a little bit different. One of the things is Transition Academy Social Club. And one of the things is going to be that if you come to our inclusive tra um, transitional employment program, we'll hire you if we have a job for you out of high school, and then we'll help you find a job somewhere else. So I'm not sure who else is going to do that. And maybe I'll turn around someday and be like, well, I was kind of foolish because I couldn't make that work financially, and that's why nobody else did it that way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was just going to say, yeah, why, why, why aren't they, right? Yeah. And they might be like, well, you know, we, we knew this. Yeah. But I think there is a path for it to work. I really do. But it's a lot harder to do that under on how we're doing it than just to say, well, you know, we're going to do it the way kind of everybody else does it. Yeah. Yeah. But I think, uh, I think trying it, like you said, like I'm, I'm a big believer in number one, just trying it. Right. Like you said, like, I don't know if I'm, you know, I'm going to try it though. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and just figuring it out. 
You know, yeah. it may be, like you said, it may be a lot harder. And maybe other people probably have tried it, but maybe they get, just gave up too soon. And I always say, like, just try it. And I, I again, like, you know, obviously there might be some things, you know, financially maybe it just wouldn't make sense, right? But there's always a way. Yeah. You know, there's always yeah. a way. Yeah. Like, and, there's always a way. And we're in a niche. We feel like we're in a niche. So, you know, for those entities out there that might be saying, okay, I kind of hear them, but we kind of do that. We, you know, not, we also feel like we're kind of in a very niche environment, meaning, you know, our coffee program for the transition employment is going to be like 12 students. I mean, we're and it's food industry only. Um, and then we're going to help employ some of those individuals and then we're going to find them, you know, jobs somewhere else. We're not really looking to take over a market. We're not really looking to change the world. I mean, we're just kind of trying to change some things for a small amount of people. So we feel like there's capacity for us to fit in all those areas. And you see if we can make a difference. So we kind of feel like we're not really infringing on anybody's territory either because we're so small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think I think uh, more people like like I said just need to work together more and stop looking at stop looking at it as like oh like you're 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 in our territory here. Yeah, and it's like you know. Yeah. And, and but I think it also kind of goes back to change and the fear of the unknown. I think that's also kind of part of it, you know. And I think when somebody like you is actually doing it, like doing the thing and actually creating change and doing it. People get intimidated, you know, because they're like, oh, shit, like he's, he, look at, oh, my God, Frank, Frank, Frank pulled it off. Frank's doing it, but, you know, and they're, they're mad because the people they just get mad because they just, they couldn't do it and they didn't do it. Yeah. And maybe too, like maybe we'll do it and, um, and maybe it will change something system wide and uh, we'll never really make any money on it, but maybe we've made an impact in, in getting enough people's attention to say, well, maybe we could do it a little bit differently. Like right now, as an example, in order to get a contract from OVR for um, a coffee shop like Coffee Inclusive, and there's there's lots of them out there in other other regions. This is the only one up in this region, but you know, there's um they're around in, in the country now. You have to be in what's called a competitive integrated environment, which means you have to have less than, I think, 25% of your workforce be people without disabilities. And so um, so we can't use those funded sources in Coffee Inclusive because it's kind of 50-50. Ah, uh, I see. All right. So, well, who made up that yeah. rule, 25%? Yeah. yeah. Like, can we change it? Yeah. Right. I'm not saying 100%. Yeah. But this is also not a not a not open to the public fake business this is like open to the public yeah so maybe that'll open up some doors for some discussions about you know those things too so i don't know do you think you know, there we'll do you think there needs to be more change like in in this in, in in you know in this conversation you know change is inevitable you know it's a it's a it's a part of the natural process and i will say that um the laws and the systems are really doing a lot better these days than they've done in the past. So, you know, I think there's definitely been, you know, with schools and with the state offices and with the federal governments, I mean, I think there's definitely been a lot of, you know, recognition that there's a that there's better ways we could do things and it's just a matter of learning and, and time. So I think so. Yeah. I think there'll be hear. more change. Yeah. yeah. they they they're they're doing a great job. I mean it really I mean if you look at um the federal government and the state government and the schools, even our new governor just, you know, put a lot of money towards it and talked about everybody should come off the waiting list. I mean, there's significant movement um, for people with ID and autism and developmental disabilities. So I, I think those conversations will continue to get better. What else are you seeing? Anything, anything else? Um, well, you know, the issue is the waiting list um, and it's all about funding. So, you know, um, the waiting list, basically, if you have an intellectual disability, um, IQ under 70, two learning disabilities diagnosed before the age of 18 typically is how it's done. Um, you're diagnosed with intellectual disability basically in school. When you age, age out of school, if you register with the local office of disabilities, you can get a waiver for services. That waiver gives you job code, gives you employment services, gives you community services, day services. You know, if you have to live in a group home, you can live in a group home, you know, housing services. So that funded source is, of supports is called a, a waiver. In every state, there's people on a waiting list for the waiver, and there's significant conversations around um, the country 
um, and the state of Pennsylvania as well about taking everybody off of the waiting list and giving them services. Now, to me, you know, I don't think the government's omni automatically going to be able to come up with all that money. So the strategies that they're working with is managed care, selective contracting. These are new things that are happening. But there's also um, a movement towards more inclusion versus more segregated services because inclusionary services like what PA Inclusive does are cheaper. In other words, if I help somebody live in an apartment for 20 hours a week, you know, that might be, you know, thirty to $40,000 a year of services. Um, if they live in a group home, which is a segregated service, you know, three or four people living in a group home, um, that's about $150,000 a year. So if you can get people to live on their own in their own apartments with supports, it could be less expensive. And the argument for people will be, well, people can't live in the apartment by themselves without supports. Well, I, we've demonstrated that they can. In fact, we have two cases. Uh, m most of the people that we support that live in their own apartments live in their own apartments without 24-7 support, number one. Number two, we have two cases that we've worked on that we took people from 24-7 to less than 24-7 supports. And not like 23-7, <laughs> okay? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, a little more. Yeah. One person went from 24-7 uh, to 16 hours a week. It's she, impressive. She now gets 16 hours a week and that's it. The other person did so well, he doesn't have a waiver anymore. He works, he lives with his girlfriend, he, does, he doesn't wow. get any services. Wow. Now I get that they're unique. Right, sure. not everybody can do that. But I'm I'm here to tell you. I mean, there are people living in group homes that could live more independently in their own apartments. So, you know, the 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 movement by the state uh, and Pennsylvania ranks up into like the top ten of states for people with ID. So I mean, it's a very it's a very good state in terms of getting services. Um, the state has been moving more services towards more inclusionary services, which are less costly and more person-centered and better for the person, right? And so the more they can do that, the more they could save money, the more they could fund other people that don't have services. Um, the other one that I'd like to see go away that I see a lot of movement in the, in the country is the subminimum wage rule. There is a rule from the 1950s that a person with a disability could work in a, in a job and get paid less than minimum wage. These these have to be, I, I don't really under, know all of it, but I mean, basically I think they have to be registered as subminimum wage companies, and we used to call them sheltered workshops. So they're like big warehouse type facilities where people with intellectual disabilities go and work, and um, they do piecemeal stuff. So they put together like, you know. Little trinkets that. Yeah. yeah. And if you. Every, for Based every, on skill level. For right? everyone you put together, you know, you you get paid 25 cents or whatever it is. Okay. And, you know, they tend to kind of work in a way that they get paid $4 for the day, you know, because they did that many, and the rest of the time it was a day program, that type of stuff. Um, there's also some programs out there where I think, and I'm not sure, but I think they kind of work as an enclave, which means there's like three or four people with ID with one job coach, and they may be subminimum wage capacities too. There's a big movement in the country to do away with subminimum wage, and I'd like to see that happen because, you know, I'm a believer that, Everybody with intellectual disabilities and autism and so on that wants to work has value, and you should pay them a fair wage for their time and for the work that they do. But we're still allowed in Pennsylvania or in, in the United States and Pennsylvania to pay subminimum wage. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. That 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 should change. I, I think that's going to change. I think that's a that's a um, that's a domino that's beginning to fall. You know, that's a house of cards that's collapsing. And yeah. I think that's going to happen in, I think, in the next few years. Yeah, so is, is that like the number one thing? Or is there like, is there something, is there anything else that you would say like, man, if I had a magic wand right now, what would I, what would I do? What could I change? You know, what, what would I maybe do differently? You know, I think a lot of what we're talking about is, um, is philosophical and opinion based. Like I think somebody should work in, a, in their own place. I think somebody should live in their own apartment, not a group home. I mean, a lot of that is a little bit more. Um, you know, choice and, and so on. The, the big one is subminimum wage. I mean, you're essentially basically taking people with intellectual disabilities and paying them below minimum wage. In, in a country that continues to talk about everybody should make a ridiculous amount of money and in, 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 in we, should, we should increase, you know, all of their um, 
uh, I don't know, what is it, uh, minimum wage, right? right well, minimum yeah. wage should go up for everybody except people with ID. But let's leave them at subminimum wage. So yeah. we forget about them. Right. And I'll tell you another story about how government doesn't really kind of think when they do things. And I don't sh- think government thinks usually at all, actually, and, Frank. And, and, I, mean, and I'm, I have to be careful, of course, <laughs> and I'm sure they... Yeah. yeah I'm sure they do, yeah. okay? But I had a girl working for me once in Pennsylvania when... um. So when, when minimum wage was like five fifteen an hour and she was in a wheelchair and she was working 20 hours a week because she wanted to work. And it was a meaningful job for her. It got her out of, out of there. She was in a wheelchair. She came to work. We made accommodations, which was kind of a big thing back in that day. It was 25 years ago. And, um, you know, the, she was on government um, health benefits and she can only work 20 hours, less than 20 hours a week at five fifteen an hour so she can keep the government health benefits. Well, the government went, Pennsylvania went to seven fifteen an hour, and they never adjusted how much she could make before she lost her health benefits. So she was like, "Look, I can only work about like eight hours now. Like, I have uh, to give this job so up." She had, yeah, she had to work less. She had. She gave her. She quit the job. She was like, "This isn't even because I couldn't." The job I had her doing was um like something that needed twenty hours of work. So. She had to quit her job. She had to lose totally. her job or she would lose her yeah. health benefits. So, oh, wow. You know, I think a lot of times when the government does things, they don't do things 100% because they forget about things. They, they forget They forget that. about what, what what's the domino effect that's going to cause. Yeah. And and they're not necessarily tuned in. Everything isn't tuned in together, right? Like if it was me, I would say, hey, look, all right, fine. You want to you raise a minimum wage? Fine. Raise a minimum wage. Why don't we do it at like, let's do a COLA every year. Let's do a cost of living arrangement. Every year is three or four or five percent, and um, everything else goes up by the same amount. So if right now you can only keep as a person with a disability on Social Security ten thousand in your bank account, that then goes to like ten thousand three hundred. Right. But they don't do that. They just keep that. They just keep it the same. And then they go, oh, well, ten years later, well, yeah, we haven't done this in ten years. Let's do this one now. It's like, why can't we just do it all? Yeah, just do it yeah, all together, all across the board. Right. But yeah. they they don't. They don't think, hmm. I guess because these bills are written in a way that it doesn't include everything. It includes these things, and that's what gets passed, and then somebody gets left out. Yeah. Plus, so, a lot of stuff is just so antiquated. I think the, there's yeah. a lot of antiquated systems. Yeah. So I think sub-minimum wage, I'd be happy if that went away. At least then it's a win. Yeah. You know? um, state institutions, federal institutions for people with ID are pretty much almost gone. I mean, that's the other big one. You know, um, more inclusion. Yeah. But that's what we do. That's what I believe. That's you. That's what PA Inclusive yeah. is. So <laughs> yeah. if you're going to ask me, that's the answers I have. Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, where can, where can people find you? If someone wants to come, like, give me, uh, give me, you know, what, what's coming up, obviously, you know, the bakery and all that, but, uh, how can people, you know, come to Coffee Inclusive? I know you touched on a little bit with the bakery, but give me, uh, give me it again. Well, www.painclusive.org. Uh, also, www.nepinclusive.org, I believe, still kind of rolls up. It probably just it redirects, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and www.coffeeinclusive.org, those two websites. Um, Coffee Inclusive will have and does have an online capacity. So if you're like, well, I'm not going to, I can't go all the way from Lackawanna County to Luzerne County. Yeah, um, they don't have their passport. They're not, you know what I mean? You the pos- buy, passport expired. Exactly. Yeah. You could buy on our website. So um, you could buy shirts on our website. Um, a friend of mine in Philadelphia, I saw about a, a mug on our website. We mailed it to her. Um, you, you're going to be able to, in the near future, if you can't already, you're going to be able to buy coffee on our website. We could ship it to you. We hope to get into like subscriptions for coffee so people could just get it delivered to their house. So um, you know, online donations on those websites, our numbers are there. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, we're downtown, downtown Pittston, which is a great place, right? I mean, downtown Pittston. I mean, we've got the waterfront. We're gonna have, we're gonna have uh, seating overlooking the waterfront with our coffee and bake inclusive. We have a rooftop bar in Pittston. We've got plenty of different types of restaurants there now. We've got great social um, programs um, in the city. Um, it's a great place to live. Uh, come to downtown Pittston and uh, have a coffee. Yeah, the only, the only thing that Pittston is missing is uh, on the stacks. Well, so you know, we'll it would be great overlooking yeah. the river, right? I know. Yeah. I, I told um, <clears throat> I told uh, Mayor Mayor Mike Lombardo that I said, "Man, like, like, let's go, help me out here. Like, I want to, you know, maybe maybe I want to come to Pittston." Do you know if you, if you ever go to um, if you ever go to Philadelphia and you go to Chicky and Peach, you can mm-hmm. see them right in the middle of the bar while you're eating before the game and they're yeah. broadcasting. You yeah. could be there right in front of the bakery and coffee I could, inclusive. I could do it. We could do it. We could be right there. 
on the stacks with pickled pizza. Pickled pizza. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm serious. I'm, uh, Brian, are, me and Brian are going to come. We'll, we'll, we'll have to set up. We could talk offline after this. And uh, who knows? Maybe I'll, maybe, uh, you know, maybe not all, all at once, but, uh, but I got a few other people in mind too. Uh, maybe, maybe Jimmy Martin, who, who yeah. I, I met, you met, I introduced you to. Um, maybe we'll throw his. I'm sure when he hears this, because he's passionate about, you know, yeah. Uh, you know, people with intellectual disabilities. So uh, maybe, uh, maybe I'll make, you know, not make him. I know he'll, when he sees this and hears this, like he'll be all about it. And he's, uh, he's gonna be like, oh, thanks for volunteering me, man. Like, I appreciate that. So, you know, we'll, uh, we'll all set something up. We'll all kind of, you know, maybe take a, take some time to come up and, you know, we can be uh, some guest baristas. Awesome. Yeah. I appreciate so, that. So, yeah. So um, April is Autism Awareness Month. And, and October might be a good time because mm. Baker will be open, et cetera. Uh, October is um, a Disability Employment Awareness Month. That'd be a great time. Okay. Because we'll be, all the bugs will be worked out of the okay. bakery so, by so then. Should we wait know? till then? I mean, we can still make a guest appearance. Just, yeah. you know, Brian's going to come up and just try some coffee and, you know, treats, whatever you guys yeah. got now. Sounds good. And, uh, you know, I'll probably still come too. But, uh, but yeah, we'll do the, we'll do the thing in October for sure. And once, uh, you know, like we'll get, we get all the bugs worked out and we'll be up there. Awesome. Yeah, man. It was great. I appreciate it. Thanks for the, thanks for the swag. Yeah, you're welcome. And, uh, I next, gave you a yeah. gift card because that makes you actually have to come there. You see, I like that. Yeah. 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 Smart. Yeah. 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 I always knew you were, you know, an intelligent guy well, besides your you. looks, you know? Thank you. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. you know, I, I don't hear that often, but the good look thing, but yeah. yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah, somebody's got to say it. <laughs> no, man, seriously, this was great. I, I appreciate you coming in, and you know, you're, uh, you're, uh, uh, you're, uh, what did I say earlier? A, uh, oh, I can't think of the word I used uh, uh, about coming back on the show. I'm blanking out. Uh, repeat offender. Rep- yeah. That's it. Yeah, you're a repeat offender. And uh, you know, I think, uh, I think they'll they'll have to be another awesome, another future, another future thing here. So we have a whole other business coming down the road. So uh, Ooh, that could okay. be a new one. Okay. So yeah, that, some, could, that so could be is, its whole. This is like a whole this is a yeah. teaser. We have another business that we're, we're going to start out of this operation. Okay. Too. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I, really I'm just really trying to get this thing. Now, right? So I'm guessing is this, this one still like not under? if you want to do a whole nother one, but I can give you a teaser. Give me a give, 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 Let's leave the people with a teaser and then we'll, you know. Yeah, just just a little bit. Don't don't give it. A, don't give it all away, though. Not all away. No. Well, let's just say it has Try. to do with coffee. Okay. Yeah. All right. I feel like, do I know this? No, I don't know. I don't know. I texted to you today, but you went you went with another direction you wanted to go with. Did you? you did. How did I miss it? I thought I, I, I thought all you said was I have some other news. Let me see. What is I don't it? know. How much time do we have? I don't know. We could. Uh, I mean, I could spill the whole thing. Well, let me let me think about this. Well, when it, when when's it happening? How about that? How will we start? How will we start there? And then we'll we'll decide if we're gonna. Um, how it's, far out? It's, it's probably going to be announced. I mean, it, it it's it, the business is now formed, so I have the official registrations. Okay. I've just got to find, uh, and I have the equipment. Okay. I just have to find uh, the person that wants to manage this and run it. Mm, interesting. So I haven't done that yet. What type of person are you looking for? I'm looking for somebody that really enjoys um, mechanical equipment um, and. Um, um, formulating recipes um, in the coffee world, hmm. uh, and somebody that really wants to, you know, make an impact with helping people with disabilities learn a new skill, um, and um, and and work in a for-profit business. This will be a for-profit business, okay, as opposed to a nonprofit. Okay, so this is your f- first for-profit venture, right? But it's going to be owned by the nonprofit. So gotcha. any profit of the of the for profit will we'll will fund the the mission of the nonprofit. I like this. Yeah. Okay. I think we're gonna leave yeah. it leave it leave it there with the teaser. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's if we launch it right, it's gonna be like cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 People right. are gonna go like somebody else had to give him that idea because he's no way cool enough to do that. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, we'll we'll talk offline about that too, and if there's anything I can do to help, uh, all right. You know, you let me know. Okay. All right. All right, Frank Bartoli on the Stacks in the Blue Door Studio. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Bill. If you want to see more on the Stacks content, subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash on the Stacks podcast or search the hashtag on the Stacks on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn.